We'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, Acorn TV. With Acorn TV, you can stream world-class television from Britain and beyond. Try Acorn TV free for 30 days by going to acorn.tv and using my promo code ONCE. For the first time ever, CrimeCon, the world's number one true crime event, is going international. CrimeCon UK will take place in London this September 25th and 26th. The weekend will be filled with true crime presentations and experiences from leading criminologists, families and survivors, forensic experts, journalists, celebrities from the true crime world, and more. You'll also have the chance to meet all your favorite true crime podcasters on CrimeCon's podcast row. I'll be there to hang out with you, answer questions, and talk true crime. CrimeCon is the ultimate true crime weekend partnered by Crime and Investigation. You won't want to miss it, so hit up your best true crime friends and plan for a great weekend of true crime on September 25th and 26th in London. To join me at CrimeCon UK, go to crimecon.co.uk. When you register, use my offer code ONCEUPON21 to get 10% off your tickets. That's crimecon.co.uk and use offer code ONCEUPON21 to get 10% off your ticket and I'll see you there. This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. This month, I'm sharing a three-part miniseries detailing the case of a serial killer who terrorized Northern California in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Because the murders occurred on hiking trails in state parks, national forests, and coastal areas, he became known as the Trailside Killer. This week, I'll continue the story where I left off in episode 204. If you haven't listened to part one, you'll want to start with that episode. If you have, I'll summarize what we've already learned. David Carpenter, a resident of San Francisco, was convicted of brutally attacking an acquaintance after luring her to a deserted area of San Francisco's Presidio, the military base located adjacent to the Golden Gate Bridge. She was saved when an alert military police officer showed up in the nick of time and rescued her from certain death. Carpenter was convicted for assault with a deadly weapon and sent to federal prison. After his release nine years later, he went on another violent crime spree. During one week in early 1970, Carpenter attacked a woman at knife point, kidnapped and raped two others, attempted to kidnap a fourth, and robbed a fifth victim at gunpoint. He was quickly identified and apprehended. In 1979, After serving a second stint of nine years in state and federal prisons, Carpenter was released on parole back to San Francisco County. Just months later, women began turning up dead on Marin County hiking trails. This is part two of The Trailside Killer. David Carpenter was paroled in 1977 for a series of attacks he'd committed in 1970. He was then sent to federal lockup at McNeil Island, Washington, to serve an additional two years for violating the conditions of his parole from an earlier conviction. He had still been under federal supervision for the 1960 attack on Lois DeAndrade when he'd committed his subsequent crimes. After his release in 1979, Carpenter swore he was a changed man. He assured the parole board that he no longer had the, quote, sexual hang-ups that caused him to commit his crimes against women, and that he was no longer a danger to society. His parole officer would note that Carpenter had, quote, abstained from drugs and alcohol while in prison, spending his time instead working as a clerk in the prison administration office. Once set free, Carpenter kept busy, seemingly trying to get his life in order. He was sent to a halfway house for recently released inmates to be kept under close supervision for the first few months of his parole. The residence was located in San Francisco, not far from his parents' home. He was also required to report regularly to a federal parole officer and seek employment. Just days after he was released, Carpenter showed up at the workplace of his daughter, Gabrielle, which happened to be located in the same neighborhood as the halfway house. 
Gabrielle had not been in contact with her father since she was an infant. She was now 20 years old. He brought her a box of candy and introduced himself. She thought he was warm and friendly, and he appeared to really want to get to know her. Like her brother Michael, Gabrielle also started keeping in touch with her father now that she was an adult. Carpenter was referred to a vocational program and began a course at a computer training school across the bay in Hayward, California. His parole officer contacted the program director with a warning. Carpenter should not be given a job working in close proximity to women, he stressed. But both men and women were enrolled in classes at the school, and Carpenter soon befriended a woman named Nancy, who was also a parolee. She had served time in prison on drug charges. He and Nancy began a relationship in which Carpenter paid her for sex. He offered to provide her with a weekly stipend if she agreed to have sex with him whenever he wanted. Later, Nancy would report that Carpenter became increasingly aggressive and rough with her. There was also another woman in Carpenter's life at that time. He had been corresponding with Molly Joe Purnell while still in prison. Molly had been married to a former convict who had taken his own life in 1978. She was still grieving this loss when she began corresponding with Carpenter. Her new pen pal sensed her vulnerability and used it to his advantage. Carpenter asked Molly to have items he purchased sent to her address. He said he'd arranged to pick them up after he was released from prison. He didn't tell her what the packages contained. Molly grew curious after one particular package arrived. The postmark was from another state, but there was no return address. Her curiosity got the better of her, and she decided to take a peek inside. She made sure to open it carefully and rewrap it afterward so Carpenter wouldn't know it had been opened. After untaping one corner of the package, she peeked inside. It was a large gun. She put it back in the closet and didn't mention it to anyone. Carpenter was released on May 21, 1979. Two weeks later, he joined the Sierra Club an organization dedicated to preserving and protecting the environment. Sierra Club members can also take advantage of hiking trips organized by the group. David Carpenter went on some of these small group outings, mostly hiking along the trails of Mount Tamalpais, located in Marin County. Mount Tamalpais, more commonly referred to by locals as Mount Tam, is the highest peak in the Marin Hills, reaching about 2,500 feet or 784 meters high. It's a popular hiking spot for San Francisco residents, conveniently located just 20 miles north from the city center and just across the Golden Gate Bridge. The majority of the mountain is contained in protected public lands and includes Mount Tamalpais State Park and Muir Woods. From mid-May to late July, David Carpenter was a star student at his computer training program. He showed up each day for classes on time without fail. He often stayed late, offering to help his instructors and the program director. He had put his typing and other clerical skills to good use while working in the prison administrative office, which earned him more freedom and extra privileges. He now used the same strategy on the outside, earning the school director's trust. Carpenter always had an end goal in mind. This time, aware that the program directors sometimes hired students to work at the printing business they owned, he hoped to impress them enough to secure one of these positions. But in late July, Carpenter started missing classes. He once called to say he wouldn't be in because his eye was bothering him and he needed to see an eye doctor. He had had very poor vision since he was a child and wore thick glasses. Carpenter continued to miss classes into early August. It was around this time that he finally had a chance to retrieve the gun he'd sent to Molly Joe's house. On the morning of August 19, 1979, 44-year-old Edda Kane set off from her home in Mill Valley for a four-hour hike on Mount Tamalpais. She was planning to go alone because her husband John had knee problems that kept him from joining his wife on these hikes. Edda drove her car and parked in the lot located at the base of the mountain before beginning her hike. John expected his wife to return sometime in the afternoon, but as the day's light began to fade, he became worried. Edda still hadn't returned home by dusk, and he knew she wouldn't stay on the mountain as it grew dark. He called the Marin County Sheriff's Department and reported his wife missing. 
When deputies arrived, they and park rangers began a search. The sun had already set, and they were unable to conduct much of a search except by flashlight. Before long, it became too dark, so they planned to reconvene in the morning at first light with a larger group of searchers. The next morning, Etta's car was found still parked where she had left it. More searchers arrived, some with search dogs, and they began combing the trails for any sign of her. Most believed she'd probably became lost on a side trail or suffered a minor injury like a sprained ankle. These were the most frequent explanations when a visitor to Mount Tam failed to return at the designated time. But late that afternoon, the body of Etta Kane was discovered, lying 60 feet up a hillside off the main trail. She was nude except for one sock. Her body was positioned oddly, face down in a kneeling position. The cause of death was quickly determined. She had been shot in the head with a large caliber weapon, a 44. From her day pack, it would later be noted that her credit cards and a small amount of cash had been taken. However, Edda was still wearing her jewelry, including her wedding ring. The county coroner would find no evidence that she had been sexually assaulted. People were shocked to learn that a woman had been found murdered on Mount Tam. It was the first time in its history that a murder had occurred on the mountain. Visitors to the park that day were tracked down and interviewed by police. Other hikers who had been on the trail the day Etta was murdered described two different men who seemed suspicious. One was a blonde man doing yoga who leaped from rock to rock and seemed to be staring intently at other hikers. But this man was also on Mount Tam the day after the murder. He was interviewed and apparently cleared. The second man was described as wearing a dark-colored hooded jacket. He stood out because the hood was pulled over his head and tied under his chin, which was odd since the day had been so warm. Some recalled that he had been standing still near the side of the trail with sweat dripping from his face. Witnesses said he appeared to be in his mid-thirties. The description was vague, and police were left with very little to go on to identify Edda's killer. David Carpenter finished his time at the halfway house and on September 6th moved back in with his parents at 38 Sussex Street in San Francisco. Francis and Elwood Carpenter were now quite elderly and his mother's eyesight had degraded so much that she had been declared legally blind. Even though Carpenter often talked about how much abuse he'd received from his parents as a child, he now returned as an adult to live with and care for them. Research studies regarding serial murder often cite life stressors experienced by the perpetrator as precipitating factors of their violent acts. A job loss, divorce, or other stressful event may occur shortly before the killer chooses his next victim or victims. Carpenter had purchased a home and his wife had given birth to their third child shortly before his attack on Lois de Andrade in 1960. Soon after his release from prison in 1969, he had met and married his second wife, by 1970, they had split. Soon after his second divorce, Carpenter embarked on his seven-day crime spree of kidnapping and rape. Now having moved back in with his mother, whom prison psychologists described as, quote, largely responsible for his hostility toward women, we can theorize that this may have played a factor in Carpenter's progression from rapist to murderer. However, I will also point out that Carpenter had begun working to obtain a weapon even before he was released from prison. It's likely that he had already planned to resume his attacks on women, but now may have decided not to leave a witness who could identify him. Etta Kane was found dead on Mount Tam, just days before Carpenter's stay at the halfway house was set to end. A few weeks later, a second woman was attacked while jogging on a San Francisco trail. Mary Frances Bennett was a 23-year-old intern at a San Francisco accounting firm. She had recently moved to the city after graduating from college in Montana. On Sunday, October 21st, Mary went for a run along the coastal trail near Land's End, a 100-acre parcel of land located on the northwestern corner of the San Francisco Peninsula. In the center of the parcel sits the Legion of Honor Museum. Land's End Trail runs along the edge of the Lincoln Park Golf Course and overlooks the Golden Gate Bridge. It is also located just two miles from the Presidio, 
where Lois DeAndrade's attack took place. That morning, golfers heard screams coming from somewhere nearby. No one reported this or made an attempt to discover where they had originated. A short time later, hikers discovered the still warm body of Mary Bennett after following a blood trail that led off the path and into the woods. She had been stabbed over 25 times and hastily buried under a layer of dirt and leaves behind the golf course. She had been so savagely attacked that responding officers described the young woman as butchered. No suspect descriptions were recorded for this murder. The killer had slipped in and out of the area unseen. That evening, David Carpenter was treated at the Marin General Hospital emergency room. He had a deep cut on his left thumb and cuts on both hands. Ground in dirt had to be cleaned from the wounds before being stitched or bandaged. Carpenter claimed he had been bitten by a dog while hiking. By now, after a prolonged period of working from home and staycations, many of you are now finding that you've pretty much burned through your watch lists and are looking for new and exciting shows and movies to keep you entertained. If this is you, then you're in luck. Acorn TV has got you covered. Acorn TV is the largest commercial-free streaming service, and it's rooted in British television. With Acorn TV, there's always something new to discover with hundreds of exclusive shows from around the world. Looking for a great mystery series? Acorn TV has some of the best, from well-loved classics to brand new exclusive mystery content. There's always a murder to solve or a mystery to ponder in the quaint village of Midsummer. Midsummer Murders has delighted British audiences for over 20 seasons, or series as they say in the UK, and you can watch them all on Acorn TV. I love the dark comic feel of the series. Even though there's a high body count on each episode, the mysteries are presented somewhat tongue-in-cheek to keep things a bit lighter than you might find in other murder shows. Give it a watch if you're a mystery fan looking for a new and binge-worthy show. You'll get thousands of hours of new and exciting content on Acorn TV for a fraction of the cost of most streaming services at just $5.99 per month. I've also found that it's one of the most reliable streaming experiences I've ever had. Super easy to watch on my tablet, phone, or computer whenever I have some free time and wherever I am. If you're ready for a streaming service that offers new stories, new characters, and breathtaking scenery each week, do what I did and get Acorn TV. Try Acorn TV free for 30 days by going to acorn.tv and use my promo code once. But you have to enter the code in all lowercase letters. That's acorn.tv and code once to get your first 30 days for free. One of the very best things you can do for a child is foster in them a love for reading. Children who love to read do better in school engage their imaginations more fully, and find learning fun. But teaching a child to read can be daunting. Finding a program that's engaging and gets results can be tricky. Hooked on Phonics has been the most trusted program to help kids learn to read for nearly 35 years. I've been a longtime fan of Hooked on Phonics. I got the program for my son when he was just learning to read. He loved it, and it made learning to read easy and fun. We had such a great experience with Hooked on Phonics My kids are now sharing it with their kids. Hooked on Phonics has continued to update its program over the years, and now it is the Learn to Read curriculum that combines an amazing app with hands-on learning materials shipped right to your home every month. Your child will build their reading skills through fun and engaging animated music videos, games, and storybooks designed to build your child's confidence and boost reading comprehension. The accompanying workbooks give your child hands-on practice to reinforce the skills they're learning with the app. And lessons take just 20 minutes or less, making it easy to plan as part of a daily routine. Whether you want to prepare your child for the next school year, keep them reading and practicing skills over the summer, or to review basics before they head back into the classroom, Hooked on Phonics is the program you need. Give your child the confidence that reading brings with Hooked on Phonics. Visit hookedonphonics.com once and receive your first month for just $1. That's Hooked on Phonics, P-H-O-N-I-C-S dot com slash once to get your first month of Hooked on Phonics for just one dollar. Hooked on Phonics dot com slash once. (music) 
One woman had already been discovered murdered on Mount Tamalpais in the late summer of 1979. Early the following year, it appeared that a killer, once again, was active on Mount Tam. On Saturday, March 8, 1980, 23-year-old Barbara Schwartz was hiking on a trail just two miles from where Etta Kane was killed. She'd brought her Labrador retriever along. Barbara had heard about the woman who was found murdered on Mount Tam and had begun taking her dog with her on hikes for extra protection. But by now, months later, she was no longer as fearful as she had been the previous year. It was about 5 p.m., and the sun was just beginning to set. Several hikers were on the trails. Two of them would later report seeing a white male, about 35 to 40 years old, walking alone on the trail. He was described as having black hair and wearing thick glasses. He was also wearing a raincoat. The other witness recalled that the man had a stern or angry expression on his face. Just before 5.30, another woman hiking in the area was on a trail that overlooked a clearing near a redwood grove. She glanced down and saw Barbara sit down to rest in the grove, with her back to a row of large trees. The witness saw a figure suddenly emerge from behind the trees and move towards Barbara. She watched as Barbara, sensing something, stood up and began to turn around. At the same moment, the man raised his arm, and the woman watched in horror as he plunged a knife toward Barbara several times. Barbara's dog began barking frantically, and the witness began yelling at the attacker and waving her arms, trying to scare him away from Barbara. Barbara struggled with the man and stumbled toward the tree line. The man ran off into the woods and out of sight. The witness ran for help. When deputies arrived, it took a few minutes to calm down Barbara's dog, who was standing over her body protectively. But it was too late. She had been stabbed in the chest and throat several times and was dead. A search was conducted based on the description given by the witness. She said the man appeared to be young, about 25 years old, and slim. Her description sharply contrasted with the ones given by other witnesses who'd seen the lone man near the grove. They described a man who was at least a decade older and more heavy set. Two clues were discovered near the crime scene. Lying near the body was a pair of black framed glasses the killer had apparently dropped. They were bifocals, prescription eyeglasses, and would be identified as being prison issued. Now investigators believe that they were looking for an ex-con, very likely with a record of violence against women. A few days later, a boning knife would be found in the dirt covered in blood, the same blood type as Barbara Schwartz's. On the evening that Barbara was killed, David Carpenter was once again seen in an emergency room for a deep cut on his right hand. The hospital was located in San Mateo County, over 30 miles from San Francisco. Carpenter's excuse for his injury this time, however, would bring him very unwanted attention by the police. He claimed that he had been attacked during a convenience store holdup earlier that evening. The emergency room doctor explained to Carpenter that he was required to report all stabbings to the police. It must have caused a slight panic in Carpenter when police officers arrived to question him. But these were officers from San Mateo County, not San Francisco, and they had not yet been informed about the murder on Mount Tam. They took down Carpenter's report and left. The ex-con with a history of violence against women, exhibiting a telltale cut on his hand, was then free to go about his business. In February 1980, David Carpenter finished his program at the training school and began looking for work. A friend of his parents offered him a job working in the warehouse of a novelty and gifts distribution business she and her husband owned. He accepted. It didn't take long before he gained his boss's trust enough to be promoted. He began traveling around Northern California, making deliveries of items like keychains, magnets, and other souvenir items to gift shops and general stores. Investigators would later try and determine if David Carpenter may have had other victims during this time. 19-year-old Carol Laughlin, an employee of the Curry Village gift shop in Yosemite National Park, had been reported missing. Her body was found months later at the base of a tunnel on the outskirts of the park. The company Carpenter worked for during that time had supplied items to the Curry Village store. Her murder remains unsolved. Carpenter was still in contact with his prison pen pal, Molly Joe Purnell. Before his release, 
Carpenter and Molly had talked about getting married, but this may have just been idle talk by Carpenter. Molly was living two hours away from him. After he was paroled, Carpenter sent her cards, but rarely saw her in person. Soon, the romance cooled to just a friendship. Molly's family was originally from Jamaica and owned property on the island. In the summer of 1980, she told Carpenter about her plan to travel to Jamaica. She had inherited some of the property, but it had been tied up in red tape for some time. She needed to see to some of the legal issues in person. It was Carpenter's idea to go with Molly, saying he would help her obtain the title and afterward look for business or investment opportunities on the island. Carpenter believed the property was worth millions. He began envisioning himself as a successful and wealthy entrepreneur. But first, as a parolee, he had to get permission to leave the state. He put in a request through his parole officer. When he finally received a response in August, it was only to discover that his request to travel out of the country had been rejected. Immediately after learning this, Carpenter showed up at Molly's house unexpectedly. He had another favor to ask. Handing her $200, he asked her to purchase a gun for him. He also gave her a clipped-out advertisement for a 38 Rossi revolver that was on sale for $199. Molly had never asked him about the large gun he'd had shipped to her house and had picked up soon after his release. She didn't bring it up now, but wondered why he needed another weapon. Molly declined to help him, saying she didn't want a gun registered in her name. But Carpenter persisted and eventually wore her down. Molly bought the weapon at a San Leandro sporting goods store. She filled out the form listing her name and Modesto address. She was told to come back on October 2nd, after the 15-day waiting period required by state law to pick it up. Two days later, on October 4th, Carpenter arrived to pick up the gun from Molly. Molly later said this was the final straw in her relationship with Carpenter. It was obvious to her now that he only used her for favors and wasn't really her friend. She gave him the gun and hoped to never have to speak to him again. Ten days later, a third woman was murdered on Mount Tam. Monday, October 13, 1980, was the Columbus Day holiday. Anne Evelyn Alderson left her home in San Rafael to visit her grandmother, who was a resident of a Hayward convalescent hospital. Anne said goodbye to her father about 3 p.m. and was expected home for dinner by 6. Anne was 26 years old and, until recently, had worked as a research scientist in Montana. She had previously served as a Peace Corps volunteer after college, living in both Peru and Colombia. Anne loved to spend time meditating outdoors, in nature. One of her favorite spots for this serene ritual was Mount Tamalpais. Before heading home after visiting her grandmother, Anne made a stop, parking her car in the lot near Mount Tam's outdoor amphitheater. At about 5 p.m., she was seen by a hiker sitting alone in the amphitheater. He recalled noticing the young blonde woman because she was not dressed like a hiker, but was wearing leather dress boots. She was sitting on a stone seat in the amphitheater with her eyes closed. From her location on a clear day, Anne would have had a view of San Francisco skyline in the distance, as well as the Golden Gate Bridge and Alcatraz and Angel Islands. The sun was just beginning to set across the water when Anne began her meditation, seated in the amphitheater. Her family would say that Anne was crazy for sunsets. Anne didn't return home that night. As it grew dark, her father began to worry. He called the police and reported his daughter missing. Around 8 p.m. that evening, Anne Alderson's car was ticketed for being parked in the Mount Tam parking lot after hours. The park ranger called the license plate number in as required. The car came back registered to a Dr. Robert Alderson in San Rafael. Dr. Alderson was contacted, and it was discovered that he had reported his 26-year-old daughter missing the night before. The car was searched. Locked in its trunk were Anne's hiking boots and purse. A description of the missing woman was broadcast, and anyone who'd seen her the day she went missing was asked to contact investigators. Those who did described seeing Anne just before sunset, sitting alone in the amphitheater. Police and park rangers were well aware that two other women had been found murdered on the mountain, not more than a mile from where Anne was last seen. 
they began to fear the worst. A search by land and air was conducted. Searchers scoured the mountainside through thick brush, steep slopes, and over craggy rocks for two days before a discovery was made. Anne's body was found on October 15th in a heavily overgrown area about a quarter mile from the amphitheater. She had been shot once in the head. Anne was found face up, fully dressed, and propped up against a rock. One of her earrings was missing. The medical examiner would determine that Anne had also been raped. Investigators now theorized that her killer had snuck up behind her and forced her into the woods at gunpoint. She had been raped, and then the killer had her put her clothes back on before he shot her, investigators believed. They also theorized that as they suspected in Etta Kane's murder, Anne may have been forced to plead for her life before being killed. If the same killer was responsible for both of these murders, it appeared that he was evolving in his cruelty towards his victims. The investigation into Anne's murder would determine that she had been killed by a 38 caliber weapon. Lab tests would conclude that the killer was a type A secretor. This meant that the killer's blood type was found not only in his blood, but was also present in other bodily fluids left behind. Secretor versus non-secretor status is determined by genetics. Type A secretors make up only about 6% of the general population. Witnesses who'd been in the area the day of the murder described a suspicious individual. A dark-haired man who appeared to be about 50 years old was seen wearing street clothes, not hiking wear, and walking near the Redwood Grove where Anne was last observed. He was dressed in dark pants and a Hawaiian-type printed shirt. He was also observed looking intently down into the amphitheater at the time Anne was meditating there. Investigators now suspected they may have a serial killer on their hands, stalking hiking trails for his victims. Between August 1979 and October 1980, three women had been brutally murdered on Mount Tamalpais, a location where a murder had never occurred previously. The public began to take note of the news reports after each body was found. Visitors to Mount Tam dwindled, with residents and tourists afraid of becoming the next victim. Mount Tamalpais is also called the Sleeping Lady, because if you gaze at the outline of its peaks from a distance, it resembles a woman lying on her back face up, a sight that, for the first time, became an ominous warning. But by now, the killer began to feel the heat as more manpower and resources were allotted to apprehend him. Additional park rangers and sheriff's deputies patrolled the trails and parks in San Francisco and Marin counties. The FBI was called in to assist in identifying the killer. Descriptions of possible suspects had circulated widely, along with composite drawings. If he didn't want to be caught, he knew he would have to find another location to satisfy his murderous impulses. He would first move north, where he would carry out a brazen double murder along a coastal trail. The search for two missing women would uncover a second double murder, further shocking the community who began living in terror of the trailside killer. I'll share the rest of the story next time on Once Upon a Crime. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. You may not think there could be much more to this story, but there is much more. I'll give you all the details when I wrap up the case of the trailside killer next week in part three. Make sure to follow or subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss an episode. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. Our administrative research and production assistant is Lorena Garcia. Our copy editor is Crystal Dernan. Original music and final sound mix by Aaron Goldberg. For more information about the podcast and the team, go to truecrimepodcast.com. There you can also find all sponsor information, including discount codes. You can also find information about CrimeCon UK and get the discount code to save money on your registration under the Events tab. Thanks once again for listening, and until next time, be good to one another. Once again, we'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, Acorn TV. With Acorn TV, you can stream world-class television from Britain and beyond. Try Acorn TV free for 30 days by going to acorn.tv 
and using my promo code once. Acorn TV, where mystery is mesmerizing and drama addictive. New and exclusive series, streaming commercial free. 